Good morning and thank you for tuning in to our monthly animal science and forage webinar series. Today I'm going to be talking about the use of whole cotton seed and beef cattle diets. And one of the things we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the agronomic characteristics of cotton production and how that ultimately influences whole cotton seed feed quality or cotton byproducts that beef producers get to use as winter feed resources. As an outline of what we're going to cover today, first of all, I wanted to talk some about field aspects of cotton production and then how when that product is harvested, beef producers use cotton byproducts as part of their winter supplementation program and highlight some of the feeding recommendations associated with those products as well as methods for transport and storage. And finally, cover some animal performance information as it relates to cow-calf operations and highlight some future research that we plan to conduct here in Alabama on this topic. As far as agronomic characteristics of whole cotton seed production, there's a few considerations to think about as it relates to how has cotton production changed over the last several years. So we know typically there is turnover in terms of the varieties of cotton that are planted as new varieties are produced. Those are ones that ultimately have changes in terms of their yield production capacity. And so with that, there may be some changes associated with the overall seed size that we get from that cotton after it's harvested, the seed density, as well as the nutritional quality of that seed. So from a cotton grower standpoint, there's an opportunity then to increase the seed value associated with cotton as it's being harvested because those changes in seed size and seed density may influence the overall bale weight that's harvested in those fields. And then on the beef producer side, that seed density change may improve or influence our overall whole cotton seed quality of the product that we receive and ultimately feed to cattle. If we take a look at our cotton components and how does that influence the byproducts then that are used as part of beef cattle production systems. First of all, we just have the overall bowl and the lint that is ginned out during that process and the seed is left behind and is a product that we can use as a beef cattle feed. We also have those holes or the bowl area surrounding the lint material and the stems associated with that. So those residues all then go into components of byproducts that represent potential feed material that can be used for livestock. Factors influencing the overall seed quality that we should be aware of from a field standpoint include the cotton variety that's being planted. So as we just mentioned, that may influence the overall seed size as well as the seed density that we're getting. The overall seed source or where that seed is coming from, how it's been stored and maintained, and then finally the growing conditions associated with the cotton production season. So in terms of field weathering, this is really maybe the biggest contributing factor for us to think about that in wet years, there would be more field weathering associated with that cotton crop compared to drier years, like maybe what we've experienced this summer, which can influence the overall seed quality. If a higher moisture product is something that's going through the gin and that whole cotton seed has more water associated with it, then we can set up a situation where that seed can go through a heat during the storage process, which would decrease the overall nutritional value of that seed product then that a livestock producer would be receiving. If we look at just a highlight of some of the cotton byproducts associated with cotton harvest, the main focus of our conversation today is around whole cotton seed, but there are also a lot of other cotton byproducts that are useful materials uh, that can be used as part of a, a beef cattle ration. One of those being gin trash. This is primarily all those parts and pieces that are left over after the ginning process. Uh, so a lot of that being the stalk or the stem material, leaf material, and hulls, which would be considered a lower quality roughage source. We can get this in loose or bulk bale form, depending on the gin that it's coming from. Cotton moat is going to be a, a similar product, but maybe one that has more immature seed associated with it. 
maybe a bit more of that lint material associated with it compared to gin trash alone. Stalk residue would be just what is remaining in the field post cotton harvest and is a product that can be grazed. And then cottonseed hulls would be, again, that area surrounding that, that bowl on the cotton plant that is a good feed roughage source as well. A lot of times producers that are using cottonseed hulls will include that in a ration to help with the consistency of a feed because it is very palatable to cattle. It helps them transition onto feed well. And it also adds a good flow and a good texture to a feed mix in your operation. Finally, one that is a very high quality resource that sometimes is often forgotten about is cottonseed meal. This would be a high protein byproduct of cotton production that is often used in small amounts in poultry diets as well as swine diets. But it's a very good high protein resource that can complement your high energy feed in your livestock system. In terms of whole cottonseed feed characteristics, if we look at overall feed value associated with those, the primary nutritional value of those is coming from the oil as part of the cottonseed, as well as the lint or the fiber material associated with that. So in terms of the overall feed value, the energy value of whole cottonseed is very good, around 96% TDN or total digestible nutrients. The reason we have such a high energy value associated with this feed is because it is high in digestible fiber coming from that lint material and then also high in fat contribution. So the fat is good from an energy standpoint, but it's also something that we'll see later on kind of sets a limit for how much whole cotton seed cattle can consume. In terms of the crude protein percentage, this is one that I think people often think about first when they think about feed quality, and it is a very high protein feed source relative to other byproducts that we can get in the state. But really, when we look at whole cotton seed, we have to look at both the energy and the protein contribution together. Okay, so this is a good balanced feed and that it's both high in energy as well as a good source of protein, which is a good complement to our hay-based feeding systems that we would often use in the winter months here in the Southeast. Whenever we get into a conversation about feeding whole cottonseed, oftentimes the use of whole cottonseed to people may be a little bit more limited or they're hesitant to use it because of potential for gossip hall toxicity. Okay, and so cotton plants naturally contain a compound called gossip hall, which when fed at high levels or is in high concentration in cotton plants can lead to toxicity or sterility problems in bulls. And so there, it should be noted that there are some differences in terms of cotton plants and their level of gossip hall that they have associated with them. So upland type cotton that's primarily grown in the Southeast has lower levels of gossip hall compared to Pima cotton, which is more grown in the Western United States. And so generally with our cotton that's produced in the Southeast, although it does contain gossip hall, it's at levels that's, that are low enough uh, to prevent these types of problems that we may encounter in terms of sterility. And we're often feeding them at a low enough level to where it's not considered an issue in terms of feed supplementation. In terms of the cost per ton associated with whole cotton seed, these numbers were gotten off of the Alabama Weekly Feedstuff and Production Cost Report. So I would encourage you to go and look at that as a resource if you have any questions about whole cotton seed costs as well as any other byproduct feed costs in the state. But the range really depends on local availability. And so it would be important to contact a local gen to determine what the price point would be in your respective area. But overall, for the last couple of years, the price point of whole cotton seed has been one that has allowed it to be a good resource for producers as a winter feed, as an economical supplementation option. In terms of the supply of whole cotton seed, generally the supply is gonna coincide with harvest season for cotton production. So October 
through March is going to be the peak supply time at most gins. And those would be the sources where you would want to contact to try to figure out whether or not you could get whole cotton seed for use as a winter supplementation product. We also have a commodity feed list that we are building that we would like to include cotton gins on. We have some gins already on the list, but those would be ones that you could reach out to as a potential resource if you're interested in potentially using whole cotton seed as a feed supplement. In terms of our winter feeding recommendations for mature beef cows, the current recommendation is for whole cotton seed to be fed at not more than half a percent of animal body weight per day. So for most cows, that would be within the five to seven pounds of whole cotton seed range per head per day. And typically one of the factors to consider is if cattle have not been exposed to whole cotton seed before or they've not eaten it before, it may take a little bit of a transition time to get them used to consuming this product. So because of the texture and consistency, we can see that lint material around the seed, it may deter livestock from consuming it at first, but they will acclimate and then go on feed at this level. So this is typically something that we may see more frequently with freshly weaned calves or stalker cattle that as young cattle, they may take a little bit longer to transition onto that than a mature cow would. In terms of self-feeding whole cotton seed, this is something that can be done because of the fat percentage associated with whole cotton seed. It will act as kind of a self-limiting feed for beef cattle in a free choice feeding situation. However, this is not going to be as efficient from a feed standpoint as hand feeding because beef cattle will have the tendency to consume more of the whole cotton seed than what you would provide at that maximum of a half a percent body weight per day feeding level. Okay, so from a labor standpoint, this is a beneficial practice because it would reduce the need to feed cattle on a daily basis. However, I think the biggest consideration in terms of hand feeding versus self feeding is largely going to be related to cost. So we know that they are going to have increased consumption using this method. And so that's something to consider when trying to determine the way that you would use this product. Also, the overall long-term implications of feeding free choice whole cotton seed during the winter kind of year after year are not really known. In most of the published work that's out there with whole cotton seed, there were not negative implications in terms of cow performance or reproduction from doing this practice. But again, in terms of a self-feeding situation, it's not going to be as efficient in terms of the feed use compared to hand feeding. Whole cotton seed transport and storage considerations are things that we should consider as we prepare for the winter feeding season. If we're in a situation where we are able to acquire whole cotton seed in bulk or large quantities, we want to make sure that we have the proper storage capacity for that. The best situation for that is going to be to store it in a covered area that's open airflow and preferably on a concrete floor or concrete pad. And that is because that whole cotton seed, the moisture that's associated with that still will exchange heat with whatever surface it's stored on. Okay? And so the best situation is going to be on a concrete floor, but we do not want to store whole cotton seed on just dirt alone because it will allow that cotton seed to begin to sweat and maybe encourage it to go through a heat which can decrease the overall feed value of that product. So if we do need to store it in an area where dirt is the only option, then we would want to create a barrier where there is some type of breathable material between the soil surface and the cottonseed product. So adding three inches of a low quality hay to that area would create that barrier, but we would not want to use plastic because that would not be a breathable surface. When we stack large quantities of whole cotton seed, we want to make sure that the stack is less than eight feet high. This reduces the chance of overheating in that situation. If we get into a situation where it's packed more densely and greater than eight feet high, then we start to have heat pockets that begin to occur throughout that whole cotton seed. And again, 
that can decrease the overall feed value in a long-term storage situation. Whole cottonseed is considered to be a bulkier feed compared to some, and this limits its use in self feeders. And because of that, it does not flow well in terms of those self feeding situations. Also in terms of depending on how you store it, if you were trying to put this in a grain bin and then maybe auger out of that grain bin, it's not going to auger out of that situation very well. In terms of the density, of whole cotton seed, we think about this being kind of a fluffy seed product. And overall, we have about 22 pounds per cubic foot. And this data is one from Cotton Incorporated and is a good number to think about when we're preparing to feed this product out and think about how much cotton seed can we get in different storage and feeding capacities. If we're going and picking up seed at the gin or maybe having that delivered to us, that overall density of that product influences how much we can acquire at one time or store in certain situations. So if we look at just on average, a tote or a bulk bag or super sack are terms often used for that. Those typically hold about a thousand pounds of whole cotton seed. Kind of a elevated level of that if you were wanting to transport a bit more. Um, a homemade 16 foot trailer with wooden sides on it is going to be one that can hold a bit more around two and a half to three tons of that product. And then a larger trailer that has a, a walking floor associated with it is going to be our more of our bulk situation where we're receiving large loads of around 25 tons. If we were just trying to calculate then when I go to feed this product, if I'm feeding a group of cattle at one time, how much would I be giving to them at one time if I were using, let's say a front end loader to be able to go and feed in a bulk situation. So I just took some dimensions from a common front end loader size and multiplied the length by the depth by the height to come up with how many cubic feet is associated with that. So in this example, our front end loader bucket was 21 cubic feet capacity. And I know that I can have 22 pounds of whole cotton seed per cubic foot. So that's around 462 pounds of whole cotton seed then that I would be able to get on this front end loader. And while that may seem like a pretty specific number for this situation, it gives you an idea that we're really within that 450 to 500 pound range with this type of system. And it gives you an example of how you may be able to calculate that at home, depending on the way you plan to feed that, whether that's with a front end loader or whether it's by going out and delivering that with five gallon buckets. Overall, there's been a lot of research conducted in terms of evaluating animal performance whenever we feed whole cotton seed in a supplementation situation. I wanted to start out by highlighting a project that we had conducted here at the E.V. Smith Research Center in Shorter, where we were simply looking at different winter feeding programs and trying to identify ways to reduce labor during the winter feeding period. So the upper left photo here shows cattle that are on one of those treatments, and this is cow-calf pairs. These cows were about three months had about three month old calves on them at the time of the start of the study. And this particular picture shows a group of cattle that are consuming 50-50 soy hulls and corn gluten feed fed every other day, along with free choice hay, access to that hay every day of the week. And then the middle photo shows the cow-calf pairs that were fed free choice whole cotton seed, as well as free choice hay. And then comparing that with winter grazing systems, so a mixture of oats, ryegrass, and crimson clover. And just looking at overall cost among those systems and animal performance. So today I just wanted to highlight the overall animal performance that we saw in those systems of grazing winter annuals versus these reduced labor winter feeding systems. And the system in the middle shows our whole cotton seed plus hay system. In that, it's important to note that these were lactating cows during this winter supplementation trial. And across all of the systems, all of the cattle maintained a body condition score of six 
or even slightly increased in body condition score on these different types of supplementation strategies. In terms of the calf performance in the systems, the reduced labor winter feeding systems had average daily gain on the calves between 2.5 to 2.7 pounds per head per day compared with our winter annual system, which had greater average daily gains around 3.3 pounds per day. But overall, we can see the, the weaning weights associated with these groups were still very respectable across each of these different systems. So what this tells us is that from a labor standpoint, we were able to reduce labor and still use these different types of strategies to carry cows in the winter. However, from a feed efficiency standpoint, this is the part that's important to note associated with that whole cotton seed system is that we did observe that the cattle would consume more than they would if we were supplementing at the half a percent body weight rate. So cattle in these groups were consuming around 10 pounds per head per day for lactating cattle that weighed around 1300 pounds. And so that was a more than what they would have done if we were using a hand feeding situation. So in terms of understanding the cost uh, for your operation, I would say it's gonna be different for each person, but the main value out of this approach was looking at it simply just from a labor standpoint, being able to maintain performance in this situation. From a feed efficiency standpoint, there's been several trials looking at the appropriate feeding levels of whole cotton seed. And we mentioned that half a percent of body weight per day is that recommended level. And that outcome came out of some of this work from South Georgia, looking at supplementation levels and comparing that to feeding whole cotton seed in a free choice situation. So at the half a percent body weight level, they observed more consistent consumption of the whole cotton seed as well as hay in that situation. Whereas in the situation where there was free choice supplementation, it seemed that there was more erratic intake or consumption of that whole cotton seed in that situation. So overall, no differences, again, in body condition score of cows in this particular study, and they all maintained at least a body condition score of six or greater across the trial. But again, this illustrates that at a hand-fed situation of half a percent of body weight per day, those animals were having the same or similar type of performance compared to those who were consuming more in the free choice situation. Kind of another way to think about the use of some of these winter supplements that I don't think we always think about is the fact that whenever we supplement our cattle, we're getting nutrient return from those cattle, whether they're in a hay feeding area or whether they're out on a pasture and we're supplementing them there. And so there is some nutrient return associated with that. So one of our students conducted a trial at the E.B. Smith Research Center with stalker cattle grazing annual ryegrass and looked at, can we use these different supplementation strategies or planting legumes to help reduce our nitrogen fertilizer needs in those cool season annual systems? So the control was an annual ryegrass system that was fertilized with 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then the additional treatments were those looking at, can we substitute 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre in that system with another source? Okay, so whether that source be coming from something like a clover, being crimson clover or arrowleaf clover, or whether that 50 pounds of nitrogen is coming from a source like one of these higher protein byproduct supplements like distiller's grains or whole cotton seed. So in this study, today I wanted to just show you the animal performance from that system and some of the stocking rate information. Overall, this is our control treatment that received the 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre in that system. And the blue bars show us the gain per acre whereas the orange line shows us the average daily gains in that system. And we can see that our nitrogen fertilized treatment was very similar to that of the distiller's grain supplemented treatment, as well as the whole cottonseed supplemented treatments. So we were able to get similar animal performance out of the system 
with the supplementation compared to our nitrogen fertilized treatments while reducing the needs for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in that system. If we look at the stocking rates, we were able to maintain similar stocking rates in all of these systems compared with our nitrogen fertilized treatment. And so really the decision as to use some of these supplements maybe as a way to substitute on nitrogen fertilizer is gonna go back to looking at what is the cost it's going to take me to feed these supplements in the winter versus if I were to fertilize my annual ryegrass pasture at 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So that's kind of the way we would think about that in terms of that decision making process. But all in all illustrates that there are some other ways we can think about getting some benefits out of these higher protein supplemental feeds such as whole cottonseed. Next steps of research that we plan to conduct in the state as it relates to whole cottonseed supplementation specifically. Myself and Dr. Jenny Kobernick, as well as Dr. Steve Brown, who are on our agronomy team, are interested in looking at how have these cotton varieties changed over time and does that influence the overall feed value associated with using whole cottonseed. So specifically, we have a list of several cotton lines that are in our Auburn breeding program, as well as some of the varieties of cotton that are grown in the state widely that we plan to evaluate for their overall digestibility, as well as their protein value associated with those. And then also screen those for their overall gossipol levels to verify whether or not we are above or below kind of the threshold that could cause problems. From a feed quality standpoint, we're interested in looking at these different cotton varieties as well as the cotton lines from this perspective, largely because we mentioned earlier that we are getting a lot of that nitrogen from whole cotton seed is going back to our land area, whether that's in the hay feeding area or whether that's in the pasture area. And so if there's a way that we can improve the ability of animals to better use that protein or better capture that protein in their diet, then that would be a beneficial practice that we could get out of this evaluation. And so we're, we want to look at where is the protein being used and is there any difference in terms of protein level and use depending on the type of cotton variety that it is. Also, we're interested in screening for overall gospel levels associated with those widely grown varieties here in the Southeast. So the implications of why this is important is to give us a better understanding of can we improve our feed use efficiency with whole cotton seed by maybe reducing some of that uh, nutrients that are gonna be returned to the pasture system and then just overall update our extension recommendations on whole cotton seed to make sure that uh, they are in line with the recommendation that maximizes the feed use efficiency in these systems and allows producers to have a better understanding of how we can use some of these cotton byproducts that are available to us in the state. The second piece of that study is to conduct an intake trial to better understand what is kind of the upper end of consumption of whole cotton seed that cattle can take in, and then what is the level of gossipol that's associated with that level from these commonly grown cotton varieties in the Southeast. So this information will be used again to update our recommendations and to, to verify what those levels of gospel are and compare that to the thresholds that do cause those sterility issues. Some of the outputs and outcomes associated with this project are to update our feed recommendations and then also be able to provide a list to producers that contains gins in the state where they can potentially purchase whole cotton seed or other cotton byproducts. And if you have a cotton gin or if you have one in your local area that's not currently on the list, please feel free to contact me after this webinar 
and we would be glad to get their information added to our list to be able to update that. So with that, if you have any additional questions, here's my contact information, and we would encourage you to visit our website, alabamabeefsystems.com, to view the commodity feed list, as well as other winter supplementation resources that are available to producers.